Um, my name is David Atkinson. I see one or two familiar faces in the audience. Um, first thing I want to say is, is that I think I've got 30 minutes, so I'd like to reach an agreement with you that five minutes from the end, can you all say you've got five minutes? That would be very, very helpful because I'm going to talk about supplier relationship management. Uh, and uh, I have a tendency to talk about supplier relationship management for days on end. So the biggest challenge I've got this morning is to try and do this inside 30 minutes. So timing is very important. Uh, let me just give you a quick uh, brief uh, description of uh, my CV so you know who you're dealing with. Um, I'm 30 years in the procurement profession. I started out, like many of us, uh, falling into the profession by accident, became a buyer with Black & Decker, worked for Lucas in the Midlands, uh, then in the automotive sector for automotive products, and then uh, Rolls-Royce in Derby and Bristol, rising from buyer to the glorious heights of procurement director. Uh, along that journey, I also took an MBA in strategy and procurement management at the University of Birmingham Business School, where I'm still a visiting lecturer today. And the last uh, 10 years, I've been a consultant and trainer in the fields of procurement, most notably supply relationship management, which is my passion, uh, but also procurement transformation. So what do I intend to cover this morning? I'm going to talk about a little bit of a history lesson, the orange of supplier relationship management, why it's become even more important, important, and I'm going to draw attention to the urgent need for us to get to grips with supply relationship management, knowing that there's people in the room here who probably feel they're already there, the benefits of supplier relationship management, but crucially, I want to bring to your attention a method of doing it. As a lot of what I hear in, uh, from people who talk about supplier relationship management, we, we talk about collaboration with suppliers, capturing supplier innovation, joint venturing, and all that sort of sexy stuff. But people don't describe it very well how it's actually done. So I'm going to give, make an attempt at doing that for you. And then I'm going to suggest to you a couple of key challenges facing uh, both the solution providers and the leaders amongst us. So. The history lesson. Supplier relationship management isn't new. Under the guise of supplier development, the automotive sector have been doing it for the best part of those 30 years that I've been in the profession. And it essentially started with the desire for organizations to protect their supply chains, to reduce working capital associated with supply chains. So in order to run just-in-time systems, you needed to have highly reliable supply chains, uh, high-performing high suppliers, all of which that could provide you with predictable service delivery. And a lot of the practices that went on in the uh, automotive industry came from what we call network sourcing, supply chain management, lean, and so on and so forth. And it's be partly, but one of the things that was, that I think, particular characteristics of the automotive sector is that they, they got before almost any of the rest of us the desire to drive performance post contract. So instead of focusing just on sourcing and deal making, they were very, very interested in making sure that they had, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, that surety of supply. And because of that, our cars are better value than they've ever been. So other sectors followed. In the 1990s, researchers such as Womack and Jones, Lamming and Peter Hines, of which there's a quotation there, all documented what was going on in the automotive sector, and it began to catch on. Aerospace in particular took it up, also other manufacturing organizations. But the common characteristic was that procurement spend represented a large percentage of company revenues and switching costs were high. Uh, it's, it's my belief, and I think the research backs it up, that the organizations who tend to be really good at supplier relationship management are the ones that have to be. And of course, global competition continues to drive pressure for imp ongoing improvements in value for money. But it didn't stop at automotive. It's become almost a mainstream capability in a lot of our organizations. So in my time as a consultant and trainer, I've seen and been involved in programs in pharmaceuticals and financial services, 
the public sector and others. And now most large organisations have some form of SRM in place and the notion of supply collaboration to improve value is, is truly caught on. Nevertheless, despite the enthusiasm for supply relationship management, there isn't really sufficient consensus around processes, how we actually do it. And so I think there remains some uncertainty about what supply relationship management actually is. So I'm going to offer you a definition. My contention is that SRM is the deliberate pursuit of sys and systematic management of post-contract value attainable from an organization's supply relationships. And there are three key elements to that that I want to bring your attention to. The first one, it's the deliberate pursuit. It is an area that's given high focus with high expectations of success in the creation and capture of value. It's not a like to have. Secondly, it's a systematic process. There is a way of proceeding through supply relationship management in a predictable and consistent way. In that uh, it almost guarantees that you're going to get a successful outcome from it. And then the focus is very much definitely on post-contract value. Now, I think that our category management processes have, done, have brought some fantastic benefits to our organizations, but we've seen all too often that at the end of the category management process, we will see supplier management or supplier performance management or contract management bolted on as the seventh step or the eighth step or whatever it might be. And I don't think we've done it justice. And I think that's often reflected in how our organizations have fairly modest aspirations when it comes to the value that you can get post-contract. So it's the deliberate pursuit, it's a systematic process, and it's about the focusing on post-contract value. So as organizations continue to outsource an increasingly large percentage of revenues, SRM continues to become important. And a report issued only in the last fortnight from Proxima was very illuminating to many, which asserted that organizations are spending 69.9% on non-labor costs, much of which is coming from the supply chain. And the, the thrust of the report was that if, um, if we focused as much on the supply chain as we focus on managing our headcount, we'd probably generate more value for our organizations. But it's also become more urgent, and there's a whole plethora of different examples of cases where things have gone particularly wrong, uh, much of which can be uh, uh, come down to the lack of oversight or effective governance, inadequate risk management, out of control cost management, a mistaken belief that supply chain power is enough to motivate suppliers, and an over-reliance on contracts. The impact of these failures and setbacks have been enormous, both to revenues, but also significantly to corporate reputations. So the need to avoid failure should indeed be a strong motivator, but there's also people should reflect and leaders should reflect on the opportunity that comes from supplier relationship management. So the upside. When organizations get it right, SRM can make a significant and positive tangible impact on the business. It's been difficult to generalize and attain consensus around the quantum of value SRM can actually deliver. Most examples are anecdotal or focused on a single supplier or a single customer supply relationship. And this may be one of the reasons why many organizations continue to be hesitant when it comes to either committing themselves to outcomes, value improvements, or investing in the technology and resources to make it a success. So several pieces of research have contributed, some of which are here. Um, so the, perhaps the uh, most striking one is at the one at the top, which talks about when you aggregate all of the potential value levers that an organization can attain up to 23% additional value. You've got two others here which talk about the leaders or the pioneers within supply relationship management can achieve three times the amount of value from their efforts than the followers. And here you've got something between 2 and 6% which came from state of flux just a couple of years ago. So there is an upside, but there isn't a real consensus around um, how we actually do it. 
And so this is what I want to reflect on now. So how do we actually make it happen? Well, I hope by now, from our experience and perhaps some of the things I've already said to you in this short session, there's a little more clarity about what SRM is and what it might be and the potential impact it has on the business, both negative and positive. But how is it actually done? And how do you make the results of it sustainable and predictable? I believe that SRM involves a sequence of activities that involve a number of critical dependencies. And I'm going to propose to you a framework for how we should be thinking about SRM. Now, most programs, whenever organizations talk about supplier relationship management, they're mostly talking about their supplier engagement. You hear things like collaboration is good, adversarial behavior is bad, we talk about partnering, we talk about innovation. We don't hear much about how they actually get there. And I think this is because organizations fail to really reflect on the cause and effect relationships between different stages in the run-up to supplier engagement. So let's start with where we mean to end just prior to our engagement, and that is with the relationship strategy. Now, the relationship strategy should be bringing to you, bringing to the organization real clarity around what it is the organization is trying to do with a given supplier, what the, uh, poten the potential quantum of opportunity is with that supplier, how critical it is to us, and how are we actually going to govern that relationship? How are we going to manage the implementation of our SRM activity, indeed our supplier engagement? That's fine, relationship strategy. But who's going to document the relationship strategy and what goes into it? Well, I've talked a little bit about what it might involve, but you need relationship analysis. So the sort of tools that we're used to, the, the porters, the power and dependency analysis, supply market analysis, relationship perception, a whole number of different factors impact on our collective shared understanding within our business of what's really going on in this relationship and what is the actual potential for us to drive significant post-contract value. Fine, you might say, yeah, we'll get somebody to do relationship analysis, but who does it? Well, most of our organizations assign a category leader to, to develop the relationship strategy and the analysis that goes with it, but the best of the organizations see it as a cross-functional endeavor. Cross-functional teams coming together, users and technical procurement specialists who will guide people through that process. Why is that important? Well, A, you're bringing more intelligence and experience to the discussion, but you're also building shared commitment on the follow-through. Cross-functional team will need to engage with a wider group of stakeholders. So the whole organization, what are our business requirements? What are we trying to achieve from this particular service or product or category that we're offering up to the supply chain? Now, my proposal, or my proposition to you, I think that thing will disappear in just a second, is that all of this is focused on a given supplier. But that's not enough because you need some enablers as well. And here are the key enablers. You need some sort of technology. You need a process. You do need tools. You need templates. Now, we're not talking necessarily about the Encyclopedia Britannica here, but you need something that will allow people to do this important work of analysis and strategy making on a relatively consistent basis. Now, of course, we'd love to do supplier relationship management with every single supplier, but we can't. So most of us know that segmentation is a crucial part of the picture. So we have to have a segmentation process that allows us to identify the most important suppliers, including the ones that have got the biggest value at creating potential. Like all change programs and similar to category management, we need a wave plan. Which suppliers are we going to focus on this year, next year, and beyond? We need senior executive sponsorship who's going to endorse the program, who are going to provide resources, knock down doors, whatever it takes to make sure that it's implemented. And of course, we need aspirational targets and a method of tracking the benefits. 
Now, we haven't got time for questions here. Um, I'm going to be on the due north stand uh, after this session for much of the rest of the day, so I'm happy to talk to people about it. But my, my feeling is that we don't have sufficiently high aspirations for post-contract value from our suppliers. And I think it's possibly the, the next wave, the next wave of competitive advantage for, for our organizations. We've been working very, very recently with an organization who has zero aspirations for post-contract supplier relationship management and believes that the focus is all about getting our sourcing right. The thing is, you have to walk and chew gum. And the best organizations assign significant resources, make significant investments to make sure that post-contract value is indeed created and then secured. So let me return to this supplier engagement. So what is it we're actually trying to do with these suppliers? Well, I'd suggest to you there are three levels of value that we should be focusing on. The first one is value protection, which is all about ensuring that the company gets what it contracts for. Performance reviews, contract risk management, essentially a relentless effort to minimize value leakage. Now, I don't know about you, but in every organization I've ever crossed the path of, there is always a whole load of people who are responsible for putting out fires, for placing and chasing orders, for resolving service quality or product quality issues, expediters. All of that costs money, and it represents value leakage. And you can see some of the solutions that are on the landscape here that help us get to grips with that protecting that value protection that I just talked about. We move on to value development, which is creating incremental value post-contract through reducing variation, process improvement, value analysis, value engineering. And how do we, asking the question, how do we secure tangible continuous improvement without letting it drain away through value leakage? Because every dollar saved through value development the interesting, the challenging stuff goes down the plug hole if we're also wasting our time trying to put out fires and creating value leakage by having ineffective value protection methods in place. So value protection and value development go absolutely hand in hand. And at the very top of a pyramid, as I could have sort of uh, laid this slide out, we have maybe value transformation, a rather highfalutin word. But it's essentially, this is the area where we get, where organizations working with their most important suppliers can make genuine strategic moves, strategic alliances, uh, real innovation, joint campaigns, joint product development, and so on and so forth. Most of us won't get there. In any one organization, when you think about the, the most strategically important suppliers, you're talking about a very, very small number indeed. You probably count them on one hand. And indeed, some organizations out there have zero strategic, genuine strategic alliances where there is a fundamental interdependence between them both. Most of our activity in supplier relationship management is going to be focused on value protection and value development. And I think that's absolutely the right thing we should be doing. If we do all that, we might optimize our value. And I'm going to come back to this issue here about real-time aggregate value tracking. I want to talk about a couple of critical challenges, though. Two key challenges that I think remain for our organizations if we actually inspire, sorry, aspire to SRM greatness. The first one is around technology. Technology has made a significant contribution, there's no doubt about it, in the pre-contract phase of what we're involved with. ERFX, e-tendering, e-auctions are all very mature these days. And we started to see some post-contract tools emerging with contract and risk management really gathering steam after the financial meltdown of 2008. However, I think the real prize for us here is that if we're able to measure the whole value spectrum, and how I've chosen to articulate that is to is about the delivery of a near standard, we'll never get complete standardization, but a near standard measurement system able to aggregate value 
on a real-time point of consumption basis. Most of us, when we're doing our contracting, particularly when we're focused on indirects, we make the best estimates we can based upon volumes about what benefits this, or this particular contract will bring to our business. Wouldn't it be fabulous if we could actually have a measure that aggregated all the value benefits, of course we have to define what those are for each of our organizations, but we were able to do that on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and we can track them the way that manufacturing organizations have been tracking price variance for, for decades now. I think it's probably the single most thing that will liberate the procurement profession. Most of us are measured by the things that are easy to measure, the price savings. Our, our, our masters, typically the CFO, not in all cases, but the CFO tends to focus very much on saving money. And yet all of us know through our professional training, our experience, that that approach begets a certain limit, limitation on our behavior and what we focus on. We know about value. We know the value our, we can bring to our organizations. We're just waiting for certain key players within our organizations to catch up with that. So it's a challenge to the profession, but I think it's also a challenge to the solution providers, is that if we're able to develop a real-time measure of value that genuinely aggregates all the value levers, the benefits, if you look, remember that report, that survey that I just showed you earlier, up to 23% additional value could be available to our organizations. The second challenge is to our leadership. And I think it's about lifting their heads, your heads, our heads, and saying that value protection is only one part of supplier relationship management. Setting goals around value protection simply isn't compelling enough. Going to the C-suite and saying, we've got fantastic targets in place where we, we you know, last year we leaked 20% of value from our key contracts, this year we leaked only 10%. I don't think that's compelling enough. So I think we need to do that, and we also need to be setting targets for post-contract value through the means or the mechanism of value, develop, uh, value development and ensure that our organizations deliberately pursue it. And I think we also need to invest in technology and know-how to make sure that we know how it's done. You could any procurement professional down the middle and you'll see running through them an appreciation of value, an acceptance that collaboration with key suppliers is a good thing. But we need to back that up with process and skills and investment in technology to make sure that we make it a reality. And finally, in closing, I hope by now that we recognize that SRM is here to stay. I think what we have to decide as leaders and organizations is just how good do we need to be at it. With 70% of revenues potentially spent in the supply chain, it shouldn't be a choice. We need to make the necessary investments to assure that we're amongst the best in our sector and to see if we can capitalize potentially on creating the next wave of competitive advantage for our organizations. I think the process of supply relationship management or supply development, whatever you wish to call it, has worked in various forms for a whole host of organizations, both in the pioneering industry of the automotive, but also aerospace, but there are many, many other examples in service industries that have come up in the last few years. And I think we need to learn from others. So for those of you with maturing SRM programs, my suggestion to you is that you stick with it. Ensure that constancy of purpose. And for others, it's time to raise your aspirations and get to work. That's it.